Hi, welcome to Archaeonomy. Today I'll be looking into the archaeology stories that have been in the news in late February 2018. Today we'll start in the Sudan, with this live science article entitled Ancient Statue of Nubian King Found in Nile River Temple. Here's the head of the statue in question. Remains of a 2,600-year-old statue with an inscription written in Egyptian hieroglyphics have been discovered in a temple in Dangil, an archaeological site along the Nile River in Sudan. Found in an ancient temple dedicated to the Egyptian god Amun, the statue depicts Aspelta, who was the ruler of the Kush kingdom between 593 BC and 568 BC. Some of Aspelta's predecessors had ruled Egypt, located to the north of Kush. So in other words, yes. They were Kangs. Though Aspelta didn't control Egypt, the inscription says in translation that he was king of Upper and Lower Egypt and was beloved of Re Herakti, a form of the Egyptian sun god Re. Or Ra, if you prefer. There's a whole thing with vowels in ancient Egyptian. And that Aspelta was given all life, stability and dominion forever. For those curious why statues with inscriptions to Ra were found in a temple dedicated to Amun, the two gods had a corporate merger of sorts in the 18th dynasty around 800 years earlier. Amun-Ra, anyone? Ra-Harakti was a later merger of Ra with an aspect of Horus. While Kush lost control of Egypt during the reign of a king named Tawetamani, reign around 664 to 653 BC, His successors, including Aspelta, still called themselves King of Upper and Lower Egypt. Sounds a bit like English royalty keeping the French fleur-de-lis in their coat of arms until 1801. In 2008, archaeologists found parts of the Aspelta statue, including the head, along with statues depicting two other Kushite kings. Taharka, reign circa 690 to 664 BC, and Senkamaniskan, reign circa 643 to 623 BC. However, those Aspelta statue parts held little of the hieroglyphic inscription, preventing archaeologists from firmly identifying the statues depicting Aspelta. It wasn't until new pieces of the statue that had the hieroglyphic inscription were discovered during fieldwork in 2016-2017 that archaeologists could identify the statue and begin the process of putting it back together. These kind of jigsaw puzzles are one of the most satisfying things about archaeology. The concept of reassembling something that was shattered thousands of years ago is really brilliant. The Amun Temple, where the statues of Aspelta, Tahaka, and Sinkamaniskan were discovered, dates back at least 2,000 years. The statues were likely constructed during the lifetimes of their respective kings, and were displayed long after those kings died, Anderson said. The temple was abandoned in the early 4th century, which is also when the kingdom of Kush collapsed, and the ruined temple was used in the 11th to 13th centuries as a burial ground by wealthy Christians. Eight tombs have been excavated in the 2016 and 2017 field seasons. Okay, now back home to New Zealand. With this New Zealand Herald article, tsunamis quakes have pummeled Wairabar, one of New Zealand's earliest settlements. For those not familiar with this site, I talked about it in my first virtual tour of New Zealand video. What's thought to have been one of the landing sites of New Zealand's first settlers about 800 years ago has since been hit by at least four major earthquakes and three tsunamis. The Wairau Bar, windswept wedge of grass and gravel off the Marlborough coastline, has been one of New Zealand's most important archaeological sites since relics uncovered there were found to have come from what were likely our first human inhabitants. Successive studies have put their arrival at the bar, which at that point would have been a scrub-covered island, at some point between 1288 and 1300. Now, two Victoria University archaeologists, Bruce McFadgen and Peter Adds, have uncovered evidence of earthquakes and tsunamis at the site over past centuries, some which may have killed some of the people once living there. Bruce literally wrote the book on this topic. If you're interested, Bruce's 2007 book, Hostile Shores, Catastrophic Events in Prehistoric New Zealand and Their Impact on Maori Coastal Communities, can still be purchased online. The authors said there had been at least four earthquakes at the bar large enough to have changed the landscape, transforming the site from an island to part of a boulder bank, as well as the surrounding area. The site has also been ravaged by three tsunamis, including one 1855 event that was large enough to have knocked down several buildings, stranded fish, and lowered the land in nearby lagoons by one to two metres. They suggest that earthquake and tsunami archaeology could be developed as a sub-discipline here in New Zealand, amongst academic archaeologists, of course. I don't think there's much commercial scope for that. 
They also state that the threat to the site from ongoing earthquakes and potential sea level rise means that the site may no longer exist by the end of the century, that it may be desirable to extract what information remains there before the site is lost, and a strategy should be developed with Rangatane, the local Maru tribe, to manage this before the site is lost completely. From the destruction of a site by nature to the restoration of one by man, the Turks to be specific, this article from the Harriet Daily News is entitled Ancient Theatre in Perga to be Restored. The ancient theatre in Perga, which is believed to date back to the 2nd century and had a capacity of 13,000 people, will undergo restoration for the first time in history. Perga is located on the south coast of Turkey, and not to be confused with the more well-known Pergamum, which is up on the west coast. Located in the ancient city of Perga, which was the capital of many civilizations, especially in the Pamphylia area, the ancient amphitheatre in the southern province of Atalia's Aksu district is as magnificent as the theatres in Ephesus and Espendos. The Turkish Cultural and Tourism Ministry General Directorate of Cultural Heritage and Museums, ye gods, provided 3 million Turkish lira, that's about 792,000 US dollars, for the restoration project to be carried out by the Antalya Directorate of Surveying Monuments. The theatre was excavated in the 80s and 90s, and the Antalya Archaeological Museum holds a lot of sculptures and artefacts from the site. The ancient theatre is made up of three main sections, the cavia, seating sections, the orchestra, and the stage. The area for the cavia and orchestra is a bit wider than a half circle. It's known that gladiator and wild animal fights are organised in the orchestra pit. The lower part of the theatre has 19 tiers, and the upper part has 23 tiers for seats. The orchestra pit is surrounded with rails. It shows us that gladiator shows are organised there. Reliefs feature the life of Dionysus, the goddess... Goddess? Did he have a sex change at some point? Hmm, Dionysus is a Greek god, I wouldn't put it past him. <clears throat> Dionysus, god of wine, a scene on the stage which has five doors that lead to the backstage. Even though most of those reliefs were damaged when the stage collapsed, the parts depicting the life of Dionysus have survived until today. Tourism plays an important role in the Turkish economy, and a good chunk of that is focused around the many Greek ruins there. Because of this, the funding is available for big restoration efforts like this, which is nice to see. Sticking with the theme of restoration of archaeological sites, we'll hop the Aegean to Greece, where in this article from the Greek Reporter, a restored ancient Greek palace gets ready for visitors. And this is not just any old palace. Work is proceeding at a rapid rate to prepare the ancient Greek palace of Philip II at Agai, in the Pella region, for public access in May, according to the Athens Macedonian news agency, AMNA. With its walls restored to a height of 1.6 metres and impressive mosaics on the hall floors uncovered, the archaeological site will be ready to receive visitors. The palace, constructed during the reign of King of Macedonia Philip II, 359 to 336 BC, the father of Alexander the Great, is three times the size of the Parthenon and belongs to a complex that includes royal burial clusters and a fortified town. For those who don't know, Philip reformed the Macedonian military, developed a fantastic siege train, conquered Greece, and then was assassinated. His son Alexander inherited a well-equipped, well-trained, and battle-hardened army, which he was able to use to secure his rule and then go off and conquer the entire Persian Empire. Sixteen columns of the peristyle's southern section and the frieze will be reconstructed to a height of eight metres. This allows us to get a comprehensive view of the building, archaeologist Angeliki Kotoridi told Amna. A total of 7,000 stone-cut blocks, measuring 1 metre long by a maximum 0.7 metre wide and 0.5 metre in height, have been made to augment the original stone blocks to shore up the massive buttress on which the palace foundation rests. The surfaces of these stones are hand-carved using tools like those employed by ancient stonemasons. The floor mosaics, which will be visible in May, include the mythological theme of the oh, 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 I can't say that on YouTube, um, bad thing happening to Europa and nature scenes. The Palace of Philip II was destroyed in the middle of the 2nd century BC, following the conquering of Macedonia by the Romans. Many of its architectural stone parts were used in constructing other buildings, Cotteridi told Amna. Now, tourism is a huge deal in Greece. So it really doesn't surprise me that despite their shaky economy, they're still pumping money into heritage tourism sites like this. I know if I was visiting Greece, I'd want to check out Philip Macedon's palace. Part of the upper floor at the palace's entranceway and a 30-metre part of the colonnade have been set up inside the new museum at Egai, 
because they could not be reconstructed in situ. According to the archaeologist, the museum will be ready by the spring of 2020. Moving on to merry old England, I have an article here from the Swindon Advertiser of all places. Bronze Age artefacts discovered as school building works get underway. Bronze Age remains, including evidence of cremations, have been found at the site of a new secondary school being built in Wichelstow. We looked at a Roman villa found at the Warwick School construction last week. The school developments have really had great luck with archaeological finds lately. Excavations during the construction of the Deanery CE Academy have revealed evidence of human settlement dating back to around 2500 BC. They include shards of pottery, bones from six cremations, and evidence of settlements such as pits and ditches from the Late Bronze Age and Early Iron Age. Let's check out the images that came with the article. This feature has a shattered Bronze Age pot on the base. I'm not sure what that is on top of it. At first glance, it looks like a clay pipe bowl, but given the time frame, that can't be it. Here we have a classical archaeological photo of dirt. My hard drive is cluttered with folders full of photos like this. This curving feature in the foreground, highlighted with the yellow spray paint, has had a section cleaned down properly and excavated out. You can also see the bulk here, just how close to the surface these features are. And here we have a half-sectioned feature with a fair bit of charcoal on the fill to the left. Damn, that's some dense clay subsoil there. The artifact above the scale bar is a spindle whorl, a weight fitted onto a spindle to help increase and maintain the speed of spinning wool. Okay, back to the article. Melanie Pomeroy Kellinger, the archaeological advisor to Swindon Borough Council, said while the site itself is not spectacular to look at, it is significant because there's very little from that time in the west of Swindon. Much of what we understood from the past in that area is from the Roman and medieval periods, and this pushes the timeline back to the late Bronze Age and early Iron Age periods, when people were living and farming on the land. Excavating these sites gives us a greater understanding of how long people have been living in what is now Swindon. The artefacts from the project will eventually go to the Swindon Museum and Art Gallery. Okay, for my last article, we're off to Malaysia, with a story that I just couldn't resist. Archaeologists find two historic cannons at Fort Cornwallis from the Malaysian inside. Did you honestly think I would skip a story about cannons? Excavation works at the historic Fort Cornwallis in Georgetown, Penang, has unearthed two East India Company, EIC, era cannons, over two centuries old. Both bear the insignia GR, Georgius Rex, which is Latin for King George, well, yes, suggesting that they are from the reign of King George III, 1760 to 1820. One of the cannons measures 2.35 metres, while the other is slightly shorter at 2.2 metres. The cannons will be sent for conservation and further analyses. Given their length and age, I imagine these are 24-pounders. I really wish they'd given the board amateur. Archaeologist Professor Maud Mokhtar Saidin, who's in charge of the excavation, said they found the cannons while they were digging for the main entrance. Fort Cornwallis, named after the then Governor-General of Bengal, Charles Cornwallis, was built by the EIC in the late 18th century. The fort started as a stockade made of palm trunks after Captain Francis Light took possession of Penang Island from Kedah for the EIC in 1786. It was then rebuilt by Indian convict labourers using bricks and stones during Colonel Arti Farquhar's term as governor of Penang, and was completed in 1810. Though intended for military use, Fort Cornwallis never engaged combat during its operational history. Today it remains to be the largest standing fort in Malaysia. The archaeological work is part of a larger project to restore the moat of the fort that was backfilled in 1922 because of a malaria outbreak. The works intend to restore the moat to its original size of 9 metres wide and 2 metres deep. Today's episode has included a lot of site restoration stories. This is a somewhat controversial topic amongst archaeologists. Some archaeologists believe that sites should be left completely as is, for maximum authenticity, and that all the changes that have occurred to a site over its history are part of the story of the site and thus valuable. These sites may then be less prominent or even completely invisible. Others believe that sites should be fully restored to how they appeared in their glory days, whenever that might be, which often results in a lot of replica components and potentially the removal of later historic material in order to expose earlier features. These sites are obviously of much greater value as tourist attractions. Striking a balance between these approaches can be very difficult. Thanks for watching. Cheers.